I'm more excited than you. Oh my god! I'm more excited than you. <laughs> I'm one of your biggest fans. Wow. Uh, t- uh, I never believed that I could have this opportunity to wow. sit before you to engage you and have this conversation. Wow. I'm really, really de- delighted. It's a big opportunity. I don't miss your uh, programs. Mm. And uh, the, the reason is very simple. Uh, wow. I love personalities uh, who speak truth to power. Wow. And you're not a DJ. You, 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 and, and I'm a big fan of reggae music. Wow. And the reason wow. I love reggae music uh, is because reggae music is not normal music. Mm-hmm. Reggae music is not just for entertainment. Mm. Reggae music is spiritual music. Mm. Reggae music is, I mean, food for the soul. Mm. There is mysticism in reggae music. Wow. Reggae music is God's message to mankind. Wow. And so I'm a massive reggae fan. So I don't miss your programs, and I'm really, really excited. Wow. Uh, you, you know, most of the kids uh, around me call me Irie because of my love for reggae music. Oh, wow. Irie, so, wow. So, wow. And, uh, you know, as far back as around um, 1978, mm-hmm. when I went to Lagos. Okay. I spent some time studying Bob Marley. Mm. So, massive fun. So, it's not by accident. And, uh, you know, we, we live in a country where many people have become highly sycophantic. mm mm-hmm. Uh, toad eaters, wheedlers, mm. praise singers, mm-hmm. and any society that has too many of such people is not a society that can grow. That's true. And that is why we need more of black rasters in the wow. system wow. to speak wow. to, to power. Wow. I'm obliged. <laughs> what, 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 what? The voice of Kwabanaya Boa. Oh my God, veteran sports writer. In fact, he was at the time uh, the sport, Sports Writers Association of Ghana president after being vice president for a number of years. You were in Lagos in 1978, true? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. What were you there for? No, I just, you know, that was a period when many Ghanaians went to Nigeria, if you remember, the Agege days. That's right. And out of just curiosity, I just decided to go there. I didn't know anybody. I had a distant family friend, so I got there. Wow. But I had the address. I went and spent some weeks and that was the period I was just decided to just focus on uh, Bob Marley, just Interesting. Re- reading a lot about Bob Marley. Interesting. So just out of curiosity, went to Lagos. <laughs> I do not think that around this time I would do the same thing because it was a massive risk at you. Ah. Getting into Lagos in the night, I'd be roaming around without knowing where I was going, go to cinema halls. And uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, but that was a period many Ghanaians decided to go to Nigeria. For real. Yeah. Then Wikipedia must be wrong. Wikipedia puts it that you were born in 1967. Nah, I think they got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, they certainly I, got it wrong. I was born in 1961. 61? But they Uh-oh. got a palm right. A palm right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Interesting. So you got to Lagos around 17, 18. 19, uh, no, 78. 1978. Now, I mean, you were around 17, 18 years old. That absolutely. I, I was. I was wow. very, very young. Mm. Uh, I don't know because uh, I got into the big world quite early mm. because uh, my parents left me when I was very young. Oh wow! My dad left me when I was only six years to the United uh, Kingdom. So at age six, <laughs> I was thrown into the big world. Wow! And uh, we lived with aunties, cousins. So. I started, I mean, roaming around this country. So at a point, I think Coco moved to uh, Komenda, to Odan, you know, uh, to Winneba, to Accra, all over the place. And there's a reason I entered football camps quite early. Mm. So as early as 1969, I moved to the camp of uh, Okawa United. You know, in Coco, there were two football teams, mm. Okawa United and Okawa Super Boma. Mm. We later met to become... Uh, Okawa United, and at that age, at the age of nine, I was in camp of Okawa stores. <laughs> and wow. It's funny, but they had a captain called uh, Motoway. Mm. Anytime they had to go and play a match, I would go with them sometime, but at that time, they would lock me in a room where they made their juju, they would light candles. And wow. My role was to ensure that if the candles went off, I would light them, because their belief was that if the candles went off, it means that the match was very tough and I had to no, no, light it out. So from Okwa stores in 1969, mm. I moved to Akotex, where my uncle played for. I don't know how old you were, but I, uh, sensational Akotex in, mm. in Akosombo. So mm. we lived in Somanya, and we moved to Akosombo for uh, training sessions. And I remember in 1973, when Akotex then beat us, Antigua by three goals, I was happy to be with them. 
So from Akotex, they moved to Kumasi to Asantikodoga around 1975. Those were the days when Osei Kofi was uh, fading off. But the days of uh, Boche, those of you uh, are familiar uh, with the line of uh, Charles Osei, uh, God in Prempe was mm. fading off. Mm. You know, so from Kotoko, I had to stay with them as a ball boy from 1975 to 1977. Wow. When I died, Chenchehini. Uh, once we us in camp, mm. when we were at Tech. Mm. You know, the team came at Tech around 76, 77. And Chenchehini came to come. He wasn't a regular member of the team. He had come to visit and was asking when he was going to be part of this team. And as a very young boy, a ball boy, we playing table tennis, and I told him, look, I see a great potential in you. And I was very young. I didn't know what I was talking about. Mm. That sooner than later, you're going to join us. Wow. And lo and behold, the following year, Chen Chen hit the limelight. There weren't many newspapers in the country at the time. You know, mm. we had Graphic Times, Mirror Spectator. Mm -hmm. Chen Chen was on the cover of the mirror. Wow. Chen Chen storms across. So he came, Kodoko Hearts, he was the best player. He developed so much affection for me and moved me to the Black Stars camp wow. in 1977. So, you know, at that time, we come to that men's group. Mm -hmm. So, the two players in the room. So, he gave me a blanket to, you know, sleep on the floor in their room. His partner, uh, Haruna Yusuf, mm. you know. So, I stayed with him throughout the whole period until the then head of state, uh, Kutua Champo. He was an ardent sports fan. Mm. And, you know, he was the president of the land, but yes. decided to also turn himself into the commissioner of sports mm. and made it uh, uh, one... Simpa Asante, his special assistant. So every now and then we come to come and ask them what they needed. We're going to host the Cup of Nations in 1978. And he asked them which country knew how to play football. And they told him Brazil. Said, okay, no problem. As the commissioner of sports, I'm decreeing that the whole team is going to Brazil for a whole year. Wow. You know, we didn't have the exodus. So all our players were based in Ghana. Hmm. So whole of 77, the team went to Brazil, went to stay there. Wow. Camping for the 78 Cup of Nations. Hmm. And Around that time, as the commissioner for sports, he declared what he called the Novelty League. It was the local league without the Black Stars players. And secondly, Hazard has won the league that particular season. So the Black Stars returned um, for the Cup of Nations in 78. We all knew they were going to win. That was the first time I saw what we called short corner kicks. Mm. It was an excellent team, absolutely excellent. You could, the names could roll off your tongue. So players like Joseph Carr, Husseini, uh, they were the goalkeepers on the right side. You had uh, PSK Paha. Uh, you had uh, Haruna Yusif. On the left side, you had Ofran San. In the middle, you had Isaac Akwe Kukudazi in central uh, uh, defense. You had Adofama, Adai Chen Chahini. You know, Yosing on the right side. Uh, Anna Seidu and Dan Kaide, whose younger brother later played for the Black Stars. Opukwa Free leading the attack. Uh, the great Mohamed Polo on the left side. Mm. Two blanks and later joined them. Ajman Prempa unfortunately got injured. And then Razak, the golden boy, you know, inside. That, that was an extraordinary team. Wow. And uh, no wonder we won the cup with ease. That was the third time wow. we won it for keeps. Wow. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Kwapna Yabo is my guest in the studio. We are talking. All right. So that was how you got yourself into sports. Now let's rewind a little bit. What kind of family were you born into? Yes, you told us your father left when you were very young. How many children were in the family? What kind of family was it? Were you... Uh, you know, fed enough three times a day. Did you go to school? <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, I, I tell you what, I forward a bit. When I started uh, sports journalism, mm. most of the Kodogo players didn't know I was the one writing. Wow. Because I was always in camp with them. So they didn't believe that I even schooled. Because I spent all my time in camp with them. Mm. Okay, so i um, born in a palm. Mm. And uh, at age three, had to move to Akosombo. So did a bit of schooling in Akosombo. And went back to Apam uh, for class two and three. Went to Nkoko for class four, uh, up to class six. Went to Komenda, then went to University of School. Mm. Uh, but I, I spent very little time in school because I was spending most of my time in football camps. Wow. Uh, again, because my parents didn't live with me, my mom and dad were in Manchester, mm. and it was very, very difficult getting food to eat. At mm. the, time. the surest way of getting food to eat was. Uh, in camps, you know, when you are, you are sure of the decent meals. Mm. And I'll never forget Francis Kumi, uh, wow. who was a member of the 1978 winning team. So uh, I remember very well the woman who served food in Kau, Antisewa. Mm. And Francis Kumi would tell Antisewa, Antisewa, small no, manu because uh, we're gonna, uh, 
<laughs> wow. Wow. So, so wow. it was a... Uh, it was it was a very difficult upbringing. Uh, we were twelve in all, mm. and uh, my daddy had no option but to. Oh, you were twelve in number. We were twelve in all, and you were number what? Uh, number seven. Number seven. Number wow. seven. So he had to. He believed in education, and he mm. thought he had to give us the best of education, and realized that if he lived in Ghana, his meager resources would not be sufficient to take care of twelve children. So he had to move out. So. Yes, at a point, every now and then we're spending time in Manchester. Oh, okay, you were uh, traveling with with yeah, wow. In, in, I remember in 1987 uh, when I decided to go for the Olympics in 1988 in Seoul. I loved John Bunn so much that mm. I decided to go and look for him in Manchester. Wow! So I went to Manchester. No, no, he was in Liverpool. So I went to Manchester. I brought my parents. They were not ready to let me go and look for John Bunn mm. because they thought. Uh, Liverpool was a very rough area. Mm. They were not too sure I would come back safe. But I prevailed. After one week, they agreed. I uh, had to give me £10 to go. I didn't know band. I didn't know how to locate him, but I was determined to see John Barnes. Wow. So I went there, uh, connected to an uncle, who told me it was not possible to see John Barnes because I was not a Liverpool fan. Mm. I didn't have a Liverpool card, and there was no anybody who was going to allow me to see John Barnes. Mm. I said, listen, you don't know who you're dealing with. Get me to the Liverpool training and leave me alone. Okay, so two days of negotiation, he mm. finally agreed, mm. took me in the training ground. Okay, so I went straight to the security guy. I said, man, I'm from Africa. I'm here to see John Barnes. Wow. He said, what, man? You're from Africa? Come on in. I mean, the man was shocked. Wow. The man who lived in Liverpool started following me. So one inside, you know, that was when John uh, Ian Rush had returned <laughs> from Juventus. <laughs> you know, he played for Liverpool, moved to Juventus, and I come back. And Kelly Douglas was the player manager. So he was the first... Uh, I, I met mm -hmm. and um, so when I'm, I, I saw him I thought he was Peter Beardsley so I went put my hand around his <laughs> around him and, and he was shocked and then I saw Peter Beardsley come I said no no you're not the one I'm like Peter Beardsley so as Ian Rush came and we started taking pictures mm. John Barnes then emerged and mm. he started screaming mm. wait for me I'll kill you I was so shocked wow he didn't know he was the one I was going to look for wow he came join us we took pictures and I remember when I came and I published the pictures in the guide. <laughs> wow. Uh, I remember uh, now Freddie Blay, mm. you know, the former chairman of the MPP. Mm -hmm. We worked on the, the guide. And he was like, no, 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 no. He, he, he never believed that I could go all the way to Liverpool to have pictures with John Barnes. And mm. he believe that mm. I had just put some pictures together. <laughs> 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 but, but it was an exciting period. All right. Uh, Were you born in September? No, in January. September bonds are those that <laughs> normally have this kind of ferocity. Were, were you born in September? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I need to join you in September. <laughs> fire! Fire! Come on, your voice, my guest. Oh, my God, we're talking about him. Oh, my God, have mercy. What an experience. <laughs> All right. So, somebody would find it difficult to understand that your father and mother lived in England, yet it was very difficult for you mm. in Ghana. Yeah. yeah. How was that? How was that? Yeah, because... Uh, as I said, we were 12, mm. and he wanted everybody to have secondary education. Mm. So we live with, uh, as I told you, cousins, mm -hmm. uncles, aunties, and times were very, very rough because to take care of 12 children, you know, although they lived there, uh, they did their best, but it, it wasn't easy. Uh, we had to really, really go through very, very tough times. Mm. And as I said, getting three square meals was not easy, mm -hmm. uh, but we were ready to uh, prevail. I do not think I'm going to blame them for that because uh, they, they gave us their best shot. Mm. And uh, so that's it, 12. And I remember before he passed, he told us that whoever wanted to suffer like him should produce plenty children. Wow. And that we needed to be measured in the number of kids we brought into the world. Wow. And make sure we be, give our, our kids uh, uh, the best attention, especially education. Interesting. So I, I guess it had to do with the numbers. Right, right. Now, from Winneba Secondary School, where did you go? Okay, so uh, my daddy was very, very keen about education, as I told you. Mm. So I had um, the opportunity to go and study uh, law uh, in Manchester. Oh, wow. I didn't go mm. because uh, at that time I then decided to go and study journalism at the School of Journalism. Mm. And my daddy never forgave me for that. Mm. Uh, that is what I call divine intervention. Wow. I believe in spirituality. Mm. I believe in Jehovah Christ. Mm. And I believe that God does so many things that we do not understand. Because growing up, I never heard about journalism. Mm. All I knew was law, law, and law. 
And when the opportunity presented itself, when the school had written to me, my daddy had bought me tickets. You know, at the time, uh, tickets went for 6000 I don't mm. know. At mm. that time, mm. uh, this is 79, 80, mm. 1977, 78. And tickets were in, and my daddy sent me 30 pounds for a bus from London to Manchester. With all that opportunity, I decided not to go. Wow. And to go and study journalism. And because of sports, mm. I believe God knew that I'm made for sports and wanted me to get into the sporting arena and is the reason and I've not regretted it so I went to school of journalism and uh, one of my biggest ex most exciting periods when I served on the Ghana Freedom Board and you know once you serve there you uh, have the opportunity of attending a number of seminars so when I had the opportunity to go to the Washington University in Virginia uh, to for a brief period in management uh, it was one of my most exciting periods Wow! but I'm not more into management. I'm still in sports. Mm -hmm. I think I'll die with sports. I started wow. with sports. And when I look back, I know that God prepared me for sports because quite as a very, very young person, I remember even at Nkoko, when the Black Stars at the time, we built a team called the Black Stars 73. So as early as 71, the likes of Mohamed Poole and others were being prepared for the senior national team. Mm. And I started following them. So... I just realized, and that is why when I talk about sport, these are not things I've read from books. These are things I lived. Yes. And I talk about them confidently. That's right. I lived them and observed them mm. and witnessed them. So I talk confidently. And uh, when I travel and I talk about sports, a uh, number of them are quite amazed and uh, they're wondering how you get all that information. So I live for it. And that's where, why I believe that uh, it's divine intervention. God decided I should get into sports right. and allow what I do. Right. So when you went to um, the school of j journalism, did yeah. you end there? Yeah. Good. So um, mm. the school of journalism. Mm. Uh, at that time, I had already started my newspaper. Right. You know, as early as uh, 1977, 78, I was writing letters to the graphic. Mm. Unfortunately, none of them got published. Wow. The only time it got published was by a paper called All Sports. Then I remember edited, All Sports. All Sports. Mm. Edited by J.B. Abbeu and M.B. Brimer. And I remember I was a school library prefect. Mm. I ordered the whole school to go to the library to go and read those letters. <laughs> 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 you know, so when I came out and I worked briefly under M.B. Brimer on all, uh, um, sports and loto, mm -hmm. then I moved to start my newspaper, which is The Guide. Mm. And it's a long history. Oh, you the, started a guide. I started a guide. Mm. You know, but at that time we had, uh, you know, we called it the flat sheets at that time, mm. because the government was very eager to control the media, mm. and that introduced the newspaper licensing regime, and had uploaded a number of papers. So the only papers which were fortunate to be on the market were the sports papers. Now I'll tell you what, the control of the media was so tight that mm. if you after writing your article, you had to send it to a gentleman at Ghanaian Times called Kutin Mensa mm. to read what he had written and use a green paper, cancel whatever he didn't want, and, wow. and then at the end of it all, okay it. That is only time your article will go to the lino. At that time, we didn't have off, uh, offset printing. We use what we call the lino. To the line for them to if they don't see the okay pen mm. there was no way they, they, it was going to uh, receive any attention so and all newspapers had to go through this all newspapers my god the newspaper license law if you didn't have the license you were liable to a 10-year imprisonment mm. and a 10 million fine at the time was that a time of rollings it was a time of rollings wow so only on mostly they were just sports papers on the market and they made sure so they criminalized the importation of newsprint, for instance. Mm. So government controlled the newsprint. The only source was the newsprint. And you were also obliged. The newspaper, the imprint, you had to put, put, print the, uh, the, the name of the publisher. What it meant was that every printing press was afraid to publish anything that had to do with politics. Because uh, you were afraid to be imprisoned. Uh, so the sports papers... Um, flourish at the time and even with the sports papers you had to make sure they did not write any line that would offend the regime and 
those are very difficult times. Yeah, so that, that was a serious infringement on press, press absolutely. freedom. Absolutely. So mm. um, what, what I did with the sports guide was that uh, there, there were three pages of sports mm -hmm. and then one page of politics. Mm. And um, at a point, uh, Freddie Bla uh, uh, Cabral Blamie here, yes. who was then the director of the School of Journalism, mm. uh, who was our director, he taught us features in journalism. Uh, he became a partner. And then his brother, big brother, uh, is a cousin, uh, Freddie Blay, mm. who later became the chairman of the MPP. Right. Also became a partner. Mm -hmm. uh, so at a point, uh, we fell out. Wow. Although I started a newspaper, and I started with 5,000. What happened? <laughs> it's a very long story. Mm. I don't know whether it would be right for me to get yes. the details on there. But, oh, yes. Uh, mm. No, it was a very bitter experience. Mm. Uh, mm. I, I felt, I didn't feel well treated, although I started a paper. Mm. Uh, I didn't feel well treated. So at a point, I just went to him and uh, told him, with my blessing, you should take the paper. I was going to start the paper. And God had blessed me with the normal talent to start a newspaper and survive. So was I it Freddie Blair you spoke to or Blair I mean her? At that time, you know, uh, Cabra Blamy here, who was then the director of the School of Journalism, mm. had a scholarship, so he moved to France. Mm. So that period, I had to deal with Freddie Blake. Oh, okay. You know, mm. and uh, I didn't feel well treated. Was it about salary? It wasn't about salary. I own the newspaper. Mm. <laughs> I own the newspaper, but I was too young and naive and too vulnerable to understand the implications of bringing on so-called partners. I didn't even understand. Mm. But as I said, I, 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 felt, I, I felt bad. What did the Stop. partners do? What was their role? Finance the newspaper? No, not at all. I was, as I said, mm. I started a newspaper. Mm. But the role of the of the of the partners, as I indicated, it was difficult getting new Spain. Government controlled the new Spain, mm. and they had links with some oh. government oh. officials. So, mm. at a point, we had to sort new Spain. Uh, <laughs> you, you need to pardon me if mm -hmm. I'm not putting out all the details, but. <laughs> <laughs> in summary, I didn't feel what treated, so mm. I moved on. Mm. And then the, the sports guide metamorphosed into the guide, and it grew bigger and bigger into the guy we see now on the market. You know. Uh, so, so technically, so you in, started daily guide I, from I, guide. I, I started. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do you get credit for it sometimes? Um, I do not think many people know this story, and I'm not. I'm not too eager to even talk about this. Are uh, you but proud of the newspaper now? Um, it, it needs a certain balance. Okay. It needs a certain balance. It's uh, too biased. It's, it needs a certain balance mm. to reflect mm. uh, all shades of opinion. But I think now it's more of a mouthpiece of the ruling regime. Mm. Uh, so if you want a certain balance, uh, you may not get it from there. I understand. Yeah. So mm. uh, I studied the Africa sports. Mm. And uh, as you indicated. Uh, Did you get his blessing when you were going away? No. I, l I left out of anger. Mm. Because I've, I really felt cheated. I've never spoken about this anywhere. This is the first time. Wow. About it. Wait, let I me <laughs> let, let, let me uh, put a seal on this. This is 3FM. Good. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't talk about it. I don't want to nurture bitterness. That's right. Uh, God says revenge is mine. Mm. Are and you a Jehovah's Witness? No, no, I'm a Christian. Christian, okay. Mm. Uh, when I say I'm a Christian, mm. I, I have... I have so, I have so much faith in Christ, mm. and I don't say this because I want to out of pride. Mm. But God snatched me when mm. I left school, so I started preaching mm. uh, those days, and I, I loved. I preached on buses. Oh wow! You preached in buses. I preached. Yeah, preached. Wow! In buses. I preached at circle a number of times. Oh wow! I would go to Abri to spend two weeks. Uh, wow! Uh, just meditating and preaching. Wow! And uh, in Switzerland, I preached. Uh, in in in, in uh, how do you call it? We had a fellowship where I, sometimes I went from house to house uh, to share the word of God. Mm. And I remember when went went around in mm. Switzerland that a big pastor from Ghana had arrived uh, in Switzerland. Mm. And you know those that had jelly kills. Mm. Oh wow! And, and they did not understand scripture very well, so they didn't believe that I also came from Africa because the understanding of Africa is. A continent of fill of degradation or a continent of illiteracy mm. so they didn't even want to credit the fact that i came from africa so wow. they, they thought i came from the U united states of america so wow. they called me brother george in, in, in switzerland wow is and george one of your names no i don't know how they settle on the george mm. <laughs> but this uh, is 3fm I, I i love talking about christ mm. i love preaching christ because uh 
after school was when uh, I got that revelation. Did you perform miracles? No. Did you heal? No. Did you prophesy? No. I, it's just a word of God, you know? Wow. Uh, miracles, yes, miracles exist, but miracles basically are for unbelievers. Mm. When I say unbelievers, uh, people need signs and wonders yes, yes. to appreciate the existence of God. That's true. But God is real. Mm. And uh, I have tasted Christ, and wow. I can testify to that. And I remember when I preached on buses, the first thing I did anytime the bus moved, I said, nobody should attempt give me money. Wow, interesting. And when I worked on sports in Little Rasta, I said this to the... Um, the glory of a sporting God. Of God. Mm. Look, I earned 3,000 CDs at a time. And 3,000 CDs was huge in 1981. Mm. Those who are old enough to live at that time. Because my brother was a customs officer who worked at PNT at Circle, and mm. his pay was 234 cities. All right? At 3,000 cities, every month I gave it to the church. Wow. Because anytime we went to preach with that naked voice, we went back and I had lost my voice. Mm. And there was nothing I could do. So the whole uh, focus was to get public address systems so it would make preaching quite easy. What church was this? Uh, this was Jesus Generation. And Yanni Bordin, Reverend and Yanni Bordin. Is it still here? He's still around. Uh, his churches are Circle. But and, and, and where were you working at that time? As I said, I was working on, at Sports and Lotto. Sports and Lotto? Sports and Lotto. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, M.B. Brahma was the editor. Mm -hmm. And then he later moved uh, to start his own newspaper, The Sporting Life. So I became the editor. And you were earning 3,000 3, cities. cities in 1980. And your huge. brother was working at the customs. That's right. And but he earned 234 how 234 cities. 234 cities. cities. So 3,000 was huge. And every single month, I gave the whole 3,000 to the church, every month. I Everything. Never, I never touched the money because my parents were bringing us money to survive to, and I didn't have needs. Wow, my that's faith. Needs, that's faith. That's a lot of faith. I gave everything to the church because my focus was to ensure that we had the public address system, you know, and I loved my joy is when I get closer and closer to God. My joy is not when about material things because it's all vanity. Mm. So you have to build your treasure where Moth cannot destroy. Thieves and moth cannot destroy. Wow. We're just passing through this world. Mm. And uh, I love Christ. He's real. I've never known you as a <laughs> preacher. I've never known that you even held the Bible or read the Bible. For how long did you donate your whole earnings to the church? Well, uh, it, it, I donated till I donated up to 24,000. My God. Up to 24,000. That's about eight solid months. That's right. And, and I, I, I don't regret it. I, I I feel proud about it. Was the money used well? I think so. Because, mm. uh, because uh, yes, we started buying the public address system. And I remember at Medina, we were mount platforms. And uh, I was very excited now we could talk into microphones. Because without the microphone, without public address in those days, rest, after 30 minutes, 45 minutes, the voice was gone. Mm. And it took a few days. Because you're screaming. There's yes. a crowd you're talking to. And you're screaming, and your voice is gone. Did you want to transition into a full-time gospel preacher? Great question, great question. I mean, at a point, those of us who started a group uh, were encouraged to abandon whatever we're doing to come into full-time full pastoral work. Mm. And I quit sports journalism for two weeks. Wow. I remember at, at that particular weekend, Great Olympics were playing against the Santi Kotoko in Accra, mm -hmm. and I uh, decided not to go. So I gave it my all. Wow. And, and uh, then Anyani Bodin, Reverend Anyani Bodin, mm. decided that uh, he thought I should go back to sports journalism. I was in disagreement. Mm. And I told him I would not go because I thought he was giving me preferential treatment and mm. that I would only go if he could use scripture to convince me. And we used to fellowship in a classroom at the time at Newtown. And we went to church and he convinced me through scripture. And that was the only time I went back to it. And I'll tell you what God did mm. with this. When I went to Switzerland, uh, Winton Rufa. Mm. You know, he was the best footballer of the century for Oceania. Mm. Now, he played in Switzerland for a team called Ara. He became so huge that he was moved to Zurich, FC Zurich. He was the biggest player in Switzerland at the time. He found the Lord, and you see, the, the issue is that when you find the Lord those early days, you think everything is sinful apart from just reading the Bible and preaching the gospel. So, his interest and commitment to his football dimmed a bit. So he wasn't paying attention. Mm. And he told me he wanted to come to Africa to preach 
I didn't think he understood the Bible very well. Mm. And the understanding of Africa is a country of illiteracy. Mm. I said, listen, won't your level will have a million people in Africa who know the scripture better than you. You don't need to come here. Mm. But you know what I'm saying, telling you this story is that the very text that Ayani Bodu used to convince me to go back to my profession. At that time, I had become cold as a Christian. Mm. I didn't read scripture for some time. I had lost it. And I prayed to God. I said, God, please help me bump into this text. So I went up there. I was with a Pukunti, a former Santico uh, mm -hmm. captain. Mm -hmm. And I opened scripture and I bumped into that. It was my happiest day. I went straight and moved the car. I went to into Rufus' house. And I went and preached to him. And I, I used it as reference point, And he accepted it. Wow. Went back to be active with his football and got another massive contract to Bremen mm. in Germany. Mm. And when he went to uh, Bremen, he was so massive. Anytime, uh, Bayern Munich were leading the league at a point with like 12 points. Mm. And anytime he scored a goal and uh, generals interviewed him, he spoke to them about the fact that he had a dream from Christ and Bremen were going to win the title. They thought he was a madman. Wow. I mean, you know, Germany, who is going to believe that Christ has spoken to you? Mm. And lo and behold, Month after month, Bayern started slipping and Bremen won the title. Mm. And Winton Rufa had never stayed in Africa, but 10% of his income was to Africa, to charity. Wow. And wow. Uh, Black Rasta, Christ is real. It's, yes, 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 true. I mean, somebody who gave his whole earnings <laughs> for eight solid months to a church, do you still pay tithes? I no longer believe, I don't believe in tithes. I wasn't doing that because of tithes. Mm. I don't believe in tithes. Mm. I believe in offering mm. from a deep heart. Mm. Tithe basically is asking you to pay one tenth of your income. That's that's true. And I don't believe it. Mm. We do not live under the law. We mm. live under the grace of Christ. Mm. And under the Israeli law, which was the tithes, they were asked to pay one tenth of their income. So the the what I was paying was one hundredth of my income. Mm. So Christians must be educated. There's blessing in giving, mm. but don't. I mean, turn it into a law. When you turn it into a law, what happens is that if the person's faith is not strong mm -hmm. and you compel him to pay the one ten, there's no blessing. That makes sense. It, uh, there's no blessing. Mm -hmm. So educate him and properly about the about giving. If the person is touched sufficiently and wants to give one whatever twentieth half, that is his faith. Don't limit it to one ten. That's true. We live under grace, and I don't believe that. I, I, so I don't I either. I pay offering, mm. but not tithes. Interesting. And I think most pastors stress tithes because they, they know. I mean, they whip fear into Christians, and they believe that is the surest way to get money. That's right. And people, once the name of God is mentioned, people, that is why the Western, the Eastern world will tell you, religion is the opium of the masses. That's true. You know, so people out of fear would have to pay without necessarily believing it. You know something that most pastors in the world have never mm. taught their followers? Mm. And it's in 2 Corinthians 8, 12 downwards. Interesting. When Paul has, I mean, encouraged people to give and told you about the blessing in giving, when you read 8, 12 going, he says, but despite all I've told you, don't give and burden yourself as you unburden others. Oh, wow. No wow. pastor ever taught that. No pastor. Mm. Because they know that the people would be wise. Mm. I mean, Christianity is not about, about money. Christianity is grace. Jesus says, freely have I given you and freely must you give. Interesting. We should not monetize Christianity. This God is 3FM. For free and we must give it freely. Mm. It's by grace that we are saved. Nobody is clean before Jehovah except the grace of Christ. Oh, wow. Kwabena Yaboa is my guest, veteran sports writer, veteran sports person. Oh my God. And we are having a very interesting conversation. Um, do you think that a day would come that you would go back to the pulpit full time? It's my dream. Wow. I would want to. I mean, when I now fellowship with the Osu Presbyterian Church. Oh, you've left your mother church? I left my mother church. Why uh, did they hurt you? <laughs> nah, I wouldn't say so, but again, mm. it, it's a long story, but my faith mm. is that any Christ preaching church is good enough for any Christian. Mm. So, because when Christ comes, 
And when we want to, we have to dine with Christ. It's not about whether one was a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Catholic. It's about Christ. So for me, once it's a Bible-believing church, and one the centrality of that church is Christ, I'm fine. Why did you leave your church? <laughs> this is Black Rasta. <laughs> this is 3FM. If I sat in that chair, the same questions I'll be asking. <laughs> Black Rasta. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> no, uh, again, uh, mm -hmm. it's another long story. But mm. but I would never, ever mm -hmm. make any disparaging comments about anybody. For mm. me, he gave me the opportunity to know Christ. And up to today, he's like a father to me. Mm. I respect and love him. That's right. And I would never forget what he did. Yes, Christ pushed me, but mm. through him. But he fell somewhere along the line. He didn't fall. Mm. Uh, I decided to move on. <laughs> mm. And you moved on with some reasons. I know that you are a very reasonable person. You would move. Was it that you found out that maybe there were some things in the check that did not sit very well with you and you wanted to leave and you left? No, not really. Mm. But I thought, um, I did not think, I thought I had got into a point where I had to move on. Oh, really? <laughs> we had to move on. Mm. But as I said... You had outgrown it, it, the teachings of his church? Not necessarily. But uh, as we speak, to be honest with you, uh, I would go back, not necessarily on a regular basis as I used to, but I have absolutely no uh, inhibition going back to fellowship with him because, as I keep telling you, he's, he's like a father, mm. very deep in scripture, uh, who also preaches Christ. And... Uh, I would, I would, I would. A few times we speak on the phone, and uh, I really, really love him. Did he, did he ever ask you to return to the church and that you should forgive whatever you had seen that did not sit too well with you? He, he, he never did that, but I think through some of the other members. Unfortunately, uh, most of us who started the group, uh, almost everybody left. Mm. Uh, the, the team that started that group, uh, only um, just a few. It means they were disappointed somewhere, somewhere along the others, line. Others left, I guess, because of money. Ah. There was no way I was going to leave because of money. Mm. Because for me, Christ is not about money. But I think others were not too happy about the way they were treated in terms of not being taken good care of. Mm. Because as I told you, mm. uh, he asked them to quit their jobs and mm. come. And maybe they were not too comfortable and too happy uh, with the way they were being taking care of. Oh, so. he asked them to quit their jobs and then come and work yeah, in yeah, the at church. That at that time, mm. uh, I mean, that was that was encouragement. Mm. That was the encouragement. Mm. Uh, a few have passed on, but uh, others, others, all the others moved. But as I said, I did not move because of that. Because was I, he good with money? Did he keep money well? We didn't. It was a group that was, they didn't have too much money mm. because his sermons were very, very strong. It, it dwelt so much on morality mm. that many people didn't, couldn't survive. Mm. The, the, the sermon was too strong for them. So was he morally upright himself? Very, very morally upright. Wow. Very, very morally upright. Wow. I don't know about now. Only God knows our hearts. Mm. <laughs> so, but, but to the best of my knowledge, he was very, very morally upright and very deep in scripture. Mm. Uh, but as I said, uh, the, the, the others who left, I guess, was because purely the fact that they were not being treated well in court. Okay. But All right. I didn't leave because of that. Mm. I'd never ever join any group because of money. Absolutely mm. not. I would rather want to contribute to the growth of the church. I do not think that. It, it's such a shame that Christianity these days, to a very large extent, has become a very cheap way for many people to make money. Charlatans have invaded the arena. People who have absolutely no business in that arena are here. And the only reason they do that is because they, 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 they pry on mm. innocent and vulnerable people by mentioning the name of God. Mm. And I feel very, very sad. And I think though that is why those who know Christ have to continue preaching the gospel to send the truth to the people. Because there are too many con men parading as, as pastors. Do you believe in prophecies? I do believe, except it's still rampant these days. Okay. I do. do you have a single prophet that you think that this is a good prophet of God in Ghana? <laughs> there are many uh, leaders I respect. Mm. So, for example, uh, mm. Dakiwad Mills is somebody I, 
I really, really respect. Mm. And I tell you why I respect. But this is a man who wears designer clothing <laughs> every time. He, he, you know, his toilet seat is gold and all that. And he the, can you, rent a whole aeroplane, you know, to fly no, no, no. with his members and all I that. I don't know who you're talking about. Ducky Wood Mills? Bishop? Oh. You, I'm sorry about that. Wrong. I was talking about Duncan Williams. <laughs> yes, but this, um, I mean, uh, um, okay. Dougie Ward Mills. Okay, so, is... <laughs> so, so let me zoom in. Let me zoom in to somebody like uh, this is Archbishop Duncan Williams. You know the credit I give him? Mm. He revolutionized Christianity in this country. Before he bombed on the scene, Christianity was very conservative. So you had to dress in a certain way. Mm. And young people didn't think they had any business following Christ hmm. because for example if you had a perm hair in those days um, you were not accepted into the church that makes sense that's right mm. if you had your nails painted mm. and if you wore trousers but he revolutionized Christianity and I remember Pat Thomas those days you know uh, and, and all the young people at the time hmm. he managed to suck them into I mean for Christ hmm. and for me it was mercy so I, I give him so much credit for that. Mm. And uh, for Bishop Doug Heward Mills, for instance, his first love, he managed to get all these young people also for Christ. And I tell you what, someone like Bishop Doug, you know, these guys live for Christ. And the reason I make this point is that, look, he's got the biggest church apart from the traditional churches. Mm. If he wants to live like an Arabian king, he can, he easily, can. He can easily do that. Mm. That is not what he does. Mm. But you see, people like Doug, Duncan and others, in my opinion, as someone who knows Christ, are true men of God. But what some of us get wrong is that they are human beings. Mm. So they get some of the things wrong. That's true. That's correct. Okay. So because we perceive them as so pious, mm. mm. sanctimonious, mm. people who should never get anything wrong. Right. Anytime they get something wrong, we get so disappointed. We yes. think they are con men. Yes. They are just human beings. Okay. They get some of the things wrong. If you go through scripture, the key men of God, every now and then, got things wrong. I am, I am <laughs> so excited at the way you are navigating this whole conversation. I'm going to take a little departure from it yeah. and look at some other interesting things. I'm speaking with Kwabna Yaboa, veteran sportsman. Oh, my God. Are you an accomplished sports person? Do you see yourself as well have reached as a sports person? In terms of uh, the practice, your writing, or, the practice, and everything. I just, I think I've just begun. I wow. have more years ahead uh, mm. because, I mean, fortunately for us, who uh, are sports journalists, the older, the better. Mm. And uh, sometimes, when I've been asked, "When are you going to quit?" As I've only begun. Wow. Because when I was growing up, one writer I took a great deal of inspiration from was Brent Glanville. Mm. And when I met Brian Glanville at, in England, when Ghana played against England, he was 90 years, and he had come to report mm. on the match. Mm. So for me, <laughs> I, as long as the good Lord has given me help and I'm in good shape, as I said, in journalism, the older the better. I understand that. So, I understand that. I mean, there were so many people on campus. I mean, T.I. Amade Secondary School in Kumasi who idolized you so much. Africa Sports newspaper was always... In fact, some people were even <laughs> punished because they were fighting over the newspaper. Africa Sports. But there were some other rumors that were going around. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you one of those. Um, was there a point that you ever had... Um, um, in our language, a mixed-blooded woman. As in, <laughs> as in, like have a child with a mis, uh, uh, mixed-blooded woman. Did you marry a mixed-blooded woman? Did you? Was there anything like that? There was a rumor like that when we were little children coming up on campus. No, never. No. So that was a lie. No, big lie. <laughs> oh my God. This is three FM. I never got involved in any woman until I married my present wife. Is she uh, mixed-blooded? She, her, her, her father was Harry Sawyer, mm -hmm. the former minister of yes, state. Yes, education. That's right. Mm. And, and the mother, uh, half Ashanti, half Italian. 
Oh, oh, so I see where the mixed blood is coming from. This is 3FM. Yeah, it was big on the campus that you were married to a mixed blooded woman. And some people said, oh, they even have a baby. So I was trying to find a way to ask that question. So there's a certain truth in it. For how long have you been married? I've been married uh, close to 30 years. Wow. Yeah. I, wow. I first met her in 1987. Wow. Yeah, so we've been we've been around for a while. <laughs> Sports highlights. Oh my god. Was the thing everybody watched in Ghana, especially the foreign tidbits and all that. Uh, ah, sports highlights. Is it still on TV? It's still on TV. Interesting. I host it every Monday. <laughs> From nineteen ninety-four. And it's, the, it's my passion, that's correct. <laughs> oh my god, have mercy. All right. Now I'm gonna get into you know some other things. Let me look at your political life. <laughs> I just saw that um in fact at the beginning of the year you were you, you know, um, sworn in as a board member of the airport. Yeah, you know, that's correct. Yes, I know that that chunk, that group is all NPP. Are you part of <laughs> the, the, the ruling party? Black Rasta. <laughs> this is three. I love FM. Black Rasta. You know, Black Rasta asks questions. <laughs> Purian. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> this is what journalism is about. That's why I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, it's a very good question. Mm. I personally hate the way this country has been so polarized mm. into NPP and DC. Mm. We are Ghanaians, and what do the two parties stand for? This, this basically is about the welfare of this country, isn't it? But it, it's so sad that any time you start a conversation, any time you start any subject, when you are critical of the regime, you are perceived NDC. Mm -hmm. When you say anything that is critical of the NDC, you are perceived NPP. I try to be apolitical. Mm. Apolitical means that my constituent is Ghana, and I love Ghana. So at every particular time, if there's an issue that has to be discussed, that has to be deb debated, it's got nothing to do with NPP and NDC. So you're not a member of the NPP? N no. I'll tell you what. Mm. I lived with my father-in-law for a very long time, Harisoya, who was an NDC That's very council true. of elder. That's true. All right. And we used to debate and fight over a number of times. And he would get sometimes, sometimes get upset with me. And, but I had to speak my mind. So I remember one occasion he was so upset with me. Mm. He wouldn't talk to me wow. uh, for about a week. And mm. then he came back and we lived together. Mm. So one day he came back from town and came back with a communique from the Christian Council. Mm. And gave me the communique and said, hey, I wanted to read and give me your opinion. You, I know you're objective. I said, well, you know I'm objective and you're always fighting me. Mm. So I speak my mind. <laughs> Listen, I work, I mean, I served on the Free Zones Board mm. under the NDC. Mm. I served on the Free Zones Board under the NPP. Wow. I'm serving at the Ghana Airport under the NPP. For me, the airport company is not owned by neither NPP nor NDC. That's Ghana. true. That's true. Whoever thinks he has brains to serve this country must serve there. Mm. It's got nothing to do with NPP and NDC. Wow. But I can understand where you're coming from. Mm. But the truth of the matter is that mm. if you're not perceived one of them, yes. the regime would not mm. give you any opportunity to serve the nation. Especially but under a president who is seen as very vindictive. <laughs> this Probably is 3FM. You are not perceived mm. as a threat or a mm. danger. They may consider, but it's got nothing to do with. I try to be because I, I, I find it so toxic, and I get very very worried in this country. That's true. When there is any subject, mm. I don't understand. For instance, why every single NDC man takes a diametrically opposed stance against NPP? I said, well, there are no neutrals. I really really don't get it. Were you there at the time that they bought a, a Christmas uh, tree for no. how many? You we, were not there? We hadn't uh, been sworn in. We hadn't been sworn in as a... Uh, what do you think about it? Well, they bought it, uh, mm -hmm. Paul Moche, mm -hmm. uh, bought it at the time. I think if I haven't spoken to him specifically about this, but I would believe that if he had an opportunity, he may, we would have loved the CEO maybe to do that. So, for example, this coming Christmas, uh, we're decorating the place, but we've got nothing to do with that. It has to be to do with Goyle, who have decided to sponsor the whole package. Mm. Uh, but as I said, uh, I did not know the peculiar conditions and circumstances under which he decided to have his name on the invoice. It could be for very good reasons, but I'm sure, considering the fury and, the, and all the uproar, 
if you had an opportunity, maybe you would have been, you would have been better of maybe staying off and letting the CEO do that job. Interesting. Kwabla Yaboa is my guest. He's a man I idolize. Oh my God. And today we are talking. We need another 10 hours to be able to complete all these things. But you are on the board right there at the Ghana airports. Yeah. Do you enjoy working with Paula Dumotri, who <laughs> many people see as overly political and all that? Do you enjoy working with I, him? You know, uh, Paul and I go back mm. uh, a few years. I saw a photo of you. He put his hands around you and all that. <laughs> that that's when I went on the board. Yes. But you know, years ago, he was also in, he loved sports. Mm. So as a young man, uh, he would come around us. When on Saturday afternoons, we would go and... Uh, Talk about sports on joy, he would come around. We've been around for a while. When he had been men some bounce on the scene as the chairman of Kotoko, he would come around uh, a few times. He's been an age long friend. Uh, okay. And then he ascended the throne as the board chair. Mm. I enjoyed working with him. The beautiful thing is that we are not rubber stamp board. Mm. Uh, we're not there to, we're there to serve the interests of this nation. Mm. So he's the board chair. We give him that respect, but... Did he lobby for you to get the job? Not at all. He's got nothing to do with that. Mm. Abso absolutely nothing. I'm sure he, he, he saw me there. I'm going but to tackle a, 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 yeah. very, a, very, a very quick one. Yeah. Um, around the president is uh, this guy called Eugene Ayn, yeah. you know, who got into <laughs> politics and within two years he's built mansions <laughs> all over the place. Now we are also hearing about one or two forcing who has also made so much, you know, he's created so much mess in the country. I don't know, have you heard about these people? What is your opinion on these? Including Paul Adumotri, your boss, <laughs> who we are told also has a mansion uh, which he built within, you know, six months. But he has come out to say it's not true. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's been living in that building for 12 solid years. Yeah. So, you go into politics, you have a mansion, uh, a two forcing, so much mess. Mm -hmm. You deny him mm -hmm. mansions, mm -hmm. fleet mm -hmm. of cars, mm -hmm. and all that. You know, without zooming into the specifics, mm -hmm. I think in Africa mm -hmm. and the third world to an extent, yeah. politics has become a shortest route to success. That's true. And there's a reason a number of people have decided to get into politics, which is, which is sad. Because I make the point that if you go to the Western world, if you want to be rich, you go into business. Either you're a business, you're an artist, you're mm -hmm. a footballer. Mm -hmm. Those are the rich people. Mm. The opposite is true. In Africa, the politicians are the ones who are rich. Mm. And we live in a very small society, very small community. Before getting into politics, most people know these guys. And then within a short space of time, within three, four years mm. into politics, mm. everybody is massively rich. Mm. I do not think it sends the right signals to a lot of people mm. into society. Mm. And I think that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way pra I mean, politics is practiced in Africa and the third world at large. You know, uh, it breeds hatred from the youth. They get exasperated uh, when they see their future being destroyed by people who call themselves politicians. That's true. And I think it is so wrong. Mm. If you want to make money, is the business world, or you are an artist, or you are into sports. These are the people who make money elsewhere, not politicians. Elsewhere, politicians go to serve society, not to go and enrich themselves. And fortunately for those societies, there are checks and balances. And those checks and balances ensure that if you're a miscreant, if you're a thief, the, the I mean, system will root you out. It doesn't matter whether the sin you committed was found out or not. If it's found out 10 years, you'll still be punished. That's true. Here in Africa, politics, the kind of democracy we practice, ensures that the people who loot state resources are protected by state apparatus, mm. which is so sad. And who are the ones who end up in prison? The petty thieves who steal banana, mm. who steal plantain, mm. who steal cassava, mm. are the ones who go to jail. That's the true. The bigger thieves mm -hmm. in society are left enjoying their loot and they're the ones we respect. They're the ones some churches will bring to come and give fat donations yes. and we'll give them front pews. It is so wrong. Part of the reason I love Jesus, apart from being the Savior, listen, Jesus did not come to align himself with the rich people. That's true. Jesus came and his best friends were the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is why the Pharisees were always fighting him. Mm -hmm. That is why the Sadducees were always fighting him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I did not come for the righteous people. He said, he who is sick, 
needs a physician. That's true. Who is well needs no physician. No, sir. Look at Jesus. When the prostitute, poor prostitute, mm. was be, going to be stoned, mm. Jesus went to her aid, mm -hmm. asked all the self righteous people, whoever was without sin, should cut the first stone. And scripture says, Jesus was writing. When he lifted his head, they had all vanished. Yes. Jesus told the woman, he said, go and sin no more. That's right. So Jesus loved sinners, mm. but did not love sin. Mm. That is the, is, is the difference. That's true. Jesus dined with people like Zacchaeus, mm. who was seen as, as a, tax, a collector. tax collector. Yes. Mm. He dealt with ordinary people. Mm. And Jesus made sure. How was he born? In mm. a manger. Mm. That's true. All right. He was born to parents who were not the richest in society at the time. Mm. He rode on a coal. So Jesus was down to it, and Jesus continually preached against excessive wealth. That's true. He said it will be more difficult for a rich man to go to heaven mm. than for a camel to go through a nail's eye. Are you rich, Governor? Yeah. Um, by God's grace, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. You're comfortable. Yeah. All right. Now, in one of your broadcasts in the days, I don't remember which year, Asante Kotoko had gone to play <laughs> somewhere, and then there was a fan, a huge fan, in fact, who, after the game, after Asante Kotoko lost, <laughs> wept, 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 wept. I don't remember, but I remember that you showed him sitting alone and weeping, and when the cameras came back on you, in fact, you were in that mood. I know you know where I'm going. I mean, recently we saw you shedding bitter tears. If I when I saw that, I wept. I was like, whoa, the passion is deep. Is it because of your love for the Ayus, or the love for the black stars, or the disappointment that made you weep? Well, I mix a mix of all that. Mm. Uh, I thought the black stars have not been too fortunate. I was overwhelmed with emotions. Let mm. me say, mm. uh, you know, you don't plan some of these things. Uh, if you are so engrossed in it, uh, by the time you realize, I just couldn't control myself. That's right. I thought the black stars uh, could have done better. Mm. We were not helped by a number of factors, and I personally feel that our coach didn't do too well. I hardly talk about coaches for the simple reason that I make a point that footballers play football. Coaches mm. don't play football. Mm -hmm. And that coaches, I mean, a coach is as good as the materials you have. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for club level uh, money plays football. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, I don't believe in that. That It's just the coach. It's the materials you have. So, for example, uh, Alex Ferguson, when he was coaching Manchester United, which was the most successful team at the time, People are forgetting that it was the richest team in the UK. Mm. I mean, they were incomparable. So anytime he saw a loophole, it was very easy for him to plug that loophole. So, for example, when he realized that his defense was leaking, he went for Yapstam, who at the time cost 10 million pounds. It was the most expensive defender at the time. And I remember well, uh, when uh, Sebast Sebastian Veron, 28 million pounds, he pushed him, he pushed Andy uh, Dwight York, and uh, Andy Cole. So it was the most successful team by That's a long right. distance mm -hmm. until Abramovich bounced on the scene mm. and also started dumping money into Chelsea and started bringing all the big stars, Mike Lysian, Drogba, and others. And then City also bounced on the scene. So at the club level, it's more about money, you know. And so I hardly criticize coaches. But this coach was lousy. Otto, right? I wouldn't use the word lousy, mm. but I, I thought. I thought he was brilliant in our last qualifier. Mm. Everybody says he qualified us to the World Cup. Mm. People are forgetting we played a series of matches before he took the last leg. Yes, he deserves credit for that. We quickly brought up Fenerjan, uh, who helped a, a great deal. And uh, I thought he was brilliant in, in the last qualifier against Nigeria, both home and away. People also forget that we didn't beat Nigeria. We qualified. Uh, Nigeria for me, created better chances, especially in the second leg. Mm. Again, divine intervention. We are going to qualify. We qualify. Credit to Otto, no question about that. But on the world stage, I personally feel he got a few things wrong. Um, for example, when we played against Brazil in the friendly game, mm. I was privileged to be there uh, in, in France. And in the first half, the team he played, you know, we considered three goals. Mm. And in the second half, he decided to alter the system and he brought on Salis mm. I mean uh, Salisu mm. so we played a three back and then the team had stability mm. so at that point we all knew that this was our team this was our system 
And that was the same team we used in our opening game against Portugal. Mm. And although we lost that game, everybody knew that the team played so well. Yes. Now, in the game against Uruguay, mm. I was wondering why, if we knew this was our team, why we would alter the system and not play the three-back. And if you go back and check the goals we conceded, if we had played the three-back, there was no way going to concede those goals. You know, so we, he got it fundamentally wrong with the way he decided to play uh, the two, I mean, mm. the 4-4-2 four, four, instead of the three-back, which was a solid team. I also thought that a few players should have started. For example, I thought Gideon Mensah should have started instead of Baba. I also thought at a point when Ayu was getting uh, tired yeah, immediately, uh, Kofichra, for instance, was stronger. I also thought a player like uh, Kamal Dean mm. was quite stronger. Bukhari was stronger. So I think he got it completely wrong. Completely, uh, completely wrong. wrong. Completely. Um, we are running out of time. We've run out of time. We have just uh, about four more minutes. In four minutes, oh my God, I wish I could <laughs> take back the time. Oh my God. Who would you say has been your all-time best coach for the Black Stars? Who? Oh. <laughs> That's a, a, a very difficult one. Uh, we've had many good coaches. Uh, mm. Osam Dodu um, aided us uh, to win the cup in 1978 and mm. also in 82 uh, when we went to Libya. But CK Jamfi goes down as the best. As the best. Without CK a shadow of doubt. CK Interesting. Jamfie. Because, you know, again, Kwame Nkrumah, who is my idol, mm. uh, and he's my idol for a simple reason that despite all the attempt to castigate and lampoon him and to vilify him, Kwame Nkrumah does not even have a single structure to his name. No, sir. As is the case of these latter-day uh, politicians, politicians yes. who have uh, come just to come as well. Mm. And uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I went to Britain. Anytime I went to Britain, one of my favorite places was Brixton, mm. where I met the black brothers and sisters. So although we lived in Mitcham, I would always go to uh, Brixton to meet black, the black uh, folks. And I had been told that some of the Jamaicans were very rough. So, and I wore the Black Stars t-shirt mm. every now and then. So I was there one, one day when a black Jamaican accosted me and asked me for money. I, was, I, I felt um, threatened. And then he spotted the Black Star jersey. He saw the national colors. Mm. He said, Kwame Nkrumah. Oh, wow. Kwame Nkrumah. This Kwame is Kwame 3FM. Is the only man who wow. studied in universities outside. It doesn't matter how hard people try to defame this man. It mm. is absolutely impossible. Wow. And that's why he himself in Krumah lives forever. And wow. indeed, his dreams will live forever. You know, so Kwame Krumah, who believed in the black personality, decided that the black man was capable of coaching the black stars. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? He didn't also think that we lived in isolation. So he picked Sige Jamfi, took him outside for training. Training. And he came back, handled the team, 63, 65. He won the trophies. Indeed, in 1982, when we went to Libya, he was... There as a t uh, team. So the records indicate that on four occasions he was with us. We won the trophy on three occasions. So clearly he goes down as the most successful. That's right. Without a shadow of doubt. And that is why I cannot understand why black Africa today mm, mm. continue to employ white coaches. I mm. can't stand it. Oh to be honest, God. when we play in the Africa Cup of Nations, mm. out of 24 teams, you see about 18 white coaches. Mm. As we speak, Zambia have just employed Avram Grant. Mm. They're telling me that the entire history of Zambia, they can't get one decent ex-footballer good enough to handle the team. That's terrible. And only the white, and we keep recycling these guys over and over across Africa. That's they terrible. Absolutely nothing for us. Mm. My guest, I want to say thank you so much. In one minute, what is the way forward for Ghana football apart from the black coach? There's juju. There's the belief in the supernatural. You know, we have to wear these kind of colors before we go in. This person doesn't have to get in there before us. Yeah. We have to walk yeah. backwards before yeah. all that. I mean, you have seen all these things. What's the way forward? We would, we would have another program uh, to exhaust all that. In fact, I'm going to be would... inviting you. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you available next week, Friday? We would see. I'll check my time and we'll see. But Thank you so much. It's a whole subject to be discussed. Yes, yes. Please, next week Friday, Kobnayan Boy is going to do us we the honors after he has checked. And then we will have him again. In fact, we need 10 hours for this, honestly. This is 3FM. I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. But in 30 seconds, can you say what the way, what the way forward for the Black Stars is? Just 30 seconds. First of all, we need uh, sound 
the mm. management has to be sound mm. and the management has to ensure that every single decision is in the supreme interest of the team and not for personal reasons. Mm. We need a sound technical team who would also ensure mm -hmm. that every decision taken will be in the interest of the team and not for any other reasons. But I think this is, we have uh, a young team. Mm -hmm. The future, I think, is very, very bright. That's right. A team of very talented footballers. Mm. Once the mix is right, once we get the selection right, mm. I think we'll go places. That's right. Kobla Yabo, thank you so much for coming on the show. I honor you. In fact, when I say Kobla Yabo, it feels heavy in my mouth. Something says, say, Anka, Kobla Yabo. Another thing says, Seh, Kobla Yabo. Another person says, the legend, Kobla Yabo. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I do want to say I appreciate you. Which is your favorite Bob Marley song? I want to play it to end it all. Any Bob Marley song. Any Bob Marley song. All right, so I'll play you this one. One drop. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it.